Thank you for uh, continuing uh, your prayers for these different things. And at the bottom of that sheet, I always put uh, or try and put some ministry prayer points. And I had asked you to pray for our Good News Club. And uh, one of the things that, that I've tried to do at uh, Haven Elementary is just connect with the um, guidance counselor there. And uh, through that connection, we did some talking, and I just uh, kind of asked her what needs she sees here at the elementary school beyond material things, beyond things that we do to help with kids who are uh, struggling just at home with uh, food and just basic needs. They, the backpack program has started in, in uh, Haven Elementary, and we try and fill some things with that and just if there's material needs, we try and give that to her. And she said one of the things beyond material was just having male influence in young boys' lives and really just in the lives of young kids. And so one of the things that uh, I said we'd start praying about that and know what we were going to do with that. But another teacher at the uh, elementary school had a program at her previous elementary school that she was a part of called the Watchdogs. I had mentioned that program to you uh, a while ago. Uh, it's It's called Dads of Great Students. That's what the dogs stand for. And basically, you volunteer for a day at the school. And the teachers will sign up for having you in their class and doing different things, and you're helping with lunchtime and recess and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, last November, this past November, uh, we did a kind of a launch of that and had a pizza party and invited dads there and dad figures there, and about 25 of them came. And so in February, uh, Amy Kentner, who is the guidance counselor there, and, and uh, Laura Schaefer, who's the school nurse, um, they, they got the material, asked me what I thought of it. I said it looks pretty cool, and um, we kind of just started, I just started praying about that, and, and I remember asking you to do that and, and asking some others uh, to be praying for that program. And that program has started in February, and uh, I think last, uh, somebody, I forget, last week, I know I posted it on Facebook, uh, the Pottsville Republican did an article about that program, about the Watchdog program. It was a really nice article, and and basically it's it's one way in which we can just have dad and dad figures in the school. And uh, it's it's I've talked to Amy about it. I'm actually going in this coming Thursday as a Watchdog dad, and uh, I got a T-shirt for that, and Lily will get to wear a T-shirt for that. So it's trying to make it a special day for the kids and for the dad who's, who's going in there, but uh, it's a great way for us just to try and influence in a small way uh, the kids in our elementary school. And uh, so when you pray for that Good News Club program, I didn't put the Watchdog program on there this week, but I, I will. Uh, that's another thing that has started at Haven Elementary. I think it's the only one that exists in Schuylkill County as a way in which we're trying to do something about our county. You know, we've been praying about Schuylkill County and asking God, what, what can we do? This is something very simple, very small, and we're praying it has a lasting effect. Uh, I know just from stories that Amy has already told me about uh, some matchups that they, they try and get this dad or dad figure matched up with this uh, young man that, uh, that they know is struggling and and do some tutoring, some one-on-one stuff, and after that, that young boy gave him a hug and said, thanks for doing that, and the dad came, came back to Amy and said, hey, sign me up for another week. I want to do this again. It's something very small, something very simple, but it can have pro- profound impacts on people's lives. So I didn't mention that. I did just think of that as I was praying, and I want you to continue to pray for that. I'll put that on there, uh, that watchdog program that is a way in which we're trying to do something here in Schuylkill County about some of the problems that we see are happening uh, in our county because of drugs and other things uh, that are taking place. So please be in prayer for that. This morning I want to uh, continue with the sermon series, The Journey to the Cross, and next Sunday uh, Andy, Pastor Andy, is going to share some of that, uh, continue this this series and, and share from another passage, and we're going to kind of go all the way up to, to Easter and just taking different episodes of Jesus' life and kind of uh, weave them into this, this journey that He's making to the cross and what that episode, what that story is kind of communicating to us 
as we also are, are making this journey, as we do it uh, each and every year, as we have this time of Lent, which, as I said, Lent is to Easter as Advent is to Christmas. It's this time of preparation of what God's going to do, this major thing that, that God's going to do. And through this time, we're going to be looking at uh, some things that are happening in, in Jesus' life. And this morning, to, to begin that thinking, um, as I shared uh, before, that uh, Scripture is this one giant story, this grand narrative that God is writing. And within this, this narrative are lots of different episodes, lots of different things. God is weaving together to write what we call redemption history. And, and now we're coming to really a, a climax of that as we make this journey to the cross and these stories that we're going to be hearing and how they impact and influence our thinking on the cross and what that means for us. And as I said last week, and as I'll, I'll say again throughout this entire time, that this journey to the cross is not just one Jesus has to make, but one all of us have to make. And the question is, are we willing to make that journey? And I'll kind of talk about that in a little bit too in, in the passages we'll be looking at this morning on why, and the nece- why, it is necess- why it is necessary that we make this journey along with Jesus. So this morning passage is taken out of Matthew chapter 17 to get us thinking about that. Uh, we need to go back to Matthew 16 where Jesus asked the question to the disciples, who do people say that I am? And he asked that question. And our who Jesus is was, was very important in, in Jewish uh, thinking as, they were, as he was claiming to be the Messiah. And of course, uh, there was a lot of different thinking on, on about who the Messiah would be. And we'll see that Jesus is kind of, in this episode of Matthew 17, the transfiguration, as it's called, is kind of showing who He truly is because people are wondering. People are saying lots of different things. And there's ways in which we do that now. You know, today, nowadays, you have to be able to have multiple forms of identification to prove who you are. You know, if you go to the grocery store and I give somebody a credit card, they want to see my driver's license because they want to make sure that who the person is on this credit card is the person on the driver's license. Not everybody does that. I don't sign the back of my credit card so that they ask me for my driver's license for an extra identification uh, because if you steal my credit card, you could just forge my signature if my signature is on the back of my credit card. So that's why I don't sign it, if, in case you were wondering. And if you do that, it's okay, but... So I show them that. There's multiple forms of identification. And you do that everywhere. And of course, nowadays we are protecting ourselves against identity theft. And then you have to say, well, this is who I am. Here's my social. Here's my birth date. Here's my password. Here's my security questions. If you do anything online, you have security questions. And there's just multiple forms of ways in which you need to prove who you are. And uh, one of the, the movies that I like... It's called Where Eagles Dare. Anybody ever hear of it with Clint Eastwood? Um, And uh, in that movie, they're infiltrating uh, Nazi Germany and stuff like that. In the one scene, there's like all these commanders and stuff sitting around the table, and there's like five different people claiming to be somebody else. This guy works for the the U.S. uh, intelligence, and this guy works for MI6, and this guy works for uh, the Gestapo, and it was just... And so this one, who is, who's the other guy? Richard, Richard Burton, yeah, I was trying to remember what his name was. Richard Burton's going around, and they're asking him all these different things. And he's like proving in multiple ways who he is. And he's giving him these books, and he's trying to claim to be somebody and convince the, some of the German high command that he is who he says he is. And so he's, he's doing things to convince them in, in a very elaborate ways. And... Uh, and then Clint Eastwood does what he does and just starts shooting people and stuff like that. So, but the point, of what I'm trying to make is that Jesus is doing this same thing. You know, there was lots of people claiming and thinking Jesus was somebody. And Jesus, throughout his ministry, as you read his biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Jesus proving to be who he says he is. And it's, it's very natural that Jesus claims this. He says he's the Messiah. Well, how do we know that? How, how can we know that you truly are the Messiah? And then Jesus does 
all these different things to prove that throughout the Gospels. We read that from beginning to end. We see, well, this is what they said the Messiah would do, and Jesus is doing it. And so we, here in Matthew 17, Jesus is kind of doing the same thing because there's a lot of people saying a lot of different things about who Jesus is. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you are one of the prophets. And Jesus says to Peter, well, who do you say that I am? Or he says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And, and that's in chapter 16. And Jesus and uh, Peter responds, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus goes on to say that uh, flesh and blood didn't uh, reveal that to you, Peter, but the Spirit. And it's kind of this, this scene where Jesus is, is really beginning and, and going a little bit deeper on letting the disciples know this journey that he is making is going to lead him to the cross. Being the Messiah is going to take him to that cross. And he begins unfolding some of that to the disciples and the very next verses in chapter 16, after G, or Peter makes that, uh, that claim about who Jesus is, this wonderful thing that, that Peter says, he says, Simon Peter had answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, in Matthew 16, verse 16. And shortly after that, where Jesus begins to tell the disciples about um, the cross and his journey that he has to make, uh, Peter says, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Peter goes from being like bragging about Jesus saying, oh, Peter, you're awesome. You, you got it. You are the son of the living God. And the next moment Peter says, no, you're not going to the cross, and Jesus basically calls him Satan. So that's, I mean, that's a difficult day for Peter. You know, you're going from the very top to the very bottom when Jesus tells you you're, you're basically like Satan. Satan just did that. I preached this last week about the temptations where Satan was trying to detour Jesus from this journey he had to make, and he says, get away from me, Satan. That's what the tests were. The tests that Jesus went through were the Satan trying to detour Jesus from going to that cross. And Peter is now doing that same thing. He says, never, never are you going to have to go to that cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block. You don't have the things of God in mind. So Jesus, again, among his, his own friends, these guys that he's been with, these guys that he's sharing life with, trying to prevent him to make this journey that he knows he has to make. And he's been trying to show the disciples in various ways. I mean, they've been hanging out with him now for three years or so, and he's trying to show the disciples in various ways who he is and what it means that he came and this journey that he has to make. And probably in Matthew chapter 17, we get a pretty fantastic image of and proof of Jesus' messiahship. Jesus says, I am this person. And in order to show the disciples, uh, something pretty amazing happens. And it says it here in Matthew chapter 17, we call the transfiguration in Matthew 17, verse uh, 1 through 9. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And after that, the disciples go on to ask some more questions because they're confused about what's happening here. And it's, it's 
confusing to us in ways too, but it was confusing differently for them because they were taught certain things. And as a Jew, you knew certain things about Elijah, about Moses, about the prophets, about what the Old Testament was saying, about the Messiah that was coming. And now the disciples were getting very confused about this. And of course, Jesus is continuing to unfold this journey he was making. And as we heard from Peter before, he can't get wrap his mind around this journey is taking him to the cross, is taking Jesus to the cross. And so that, that scripture, uh, the transfiguration, uh, is God is fulfilling this, a lot of the things that he had begun writing in the Old Testament with the Jews. There are multiple allusions there to Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, the transfiguration, is, it, the, the Greek word is metamorpho, to change in form or to transform. Uh, and it includes lots of different allusions to the Old Testament. And, every, and, and Peter, James, and John, they would have they understood that right away. They would have known what this is saying. The, the readers of these letters, the readers of these gospels, these stories, um, they would have understood that. They were primarily Jews, and they would have got a lot of these references. For us, it's a bit confusing. But again, it's this grand narrative that God is writing, and He's not finished writing it with the Jews. He was culminating it in Jesus. That after six days, Jesus went up to the mountain is basically almost a direct quotation of Moses going up on the Mount Sinai and hearing from God. The things that Matthew is saying, and, and Mark says it a little bit differently in his biography in the gospel, the things that he's saying are, are basically the same words being used to describe Moses. When Moses was there and, and they heard God speak and the cloud was there, and from the cloud God spoke, and when Moses came down off the mountain, his face was so radiant and shining and glowing that they couldn't even look at him, the same thing is happening right here in this scene. And Peter, James, and John would have known that. And, of course, it says Moses appears and Elijah appears. And so we are seeing, we are witnessing Jesus proving, I would say beyond a shadow of a doubt, who he is, that he is the Messiah, and that he is going to be going to the cross. And they're using what seems and things that we don't necessarily get because we're not as steeped in Old Testament as the Jews were, or in Jewish tradition and Jewish and Judaism itself, anybody reading this would have gotten this. Peter, James, and John would have gotten this. They didn't understand exactly what was happening, but they knew God was doing something here as we hear some words being said, some uh, allusions being made, some specific references being talked about in terms of Moses and Mount Sinai, in terms of Elijah and the things that God did through him. The story that God was writing was being fulfilled in Jesus. This grand narrative of what God had done in redemption history with the Jews is now coming to fulfillment in Jesus. And Jesus is showing that, and Jesus is proving himself to be who he says he is. The Jewish people expected Elijah and Moses to return in the end of the age. When, when it was all coming to an end, when God was going to set things right, Jewish people, Jewish tradition said that Elijah and Moses were going to be coming back. Because Elijah, they didn't believe, actually died, that God just took him up, and God is the one who buried Moses. And so these two, I mean, if you were playing a game as a kid, and you were trying to pick out the best uh, prophet you wanted to be, these were the two guys you chose. Because, I mean, they didn't pretend to play baseball. You know, when I played baseball, I pretended to be Cal Ripken. Well, they didn't have baseball back then. So they pretended to be these, I'm making this up, they pretended to be these prophets. Well, Elijah and Moses were like, that's who you picked first. If you were going to be anybody, you were Elijah's, Elijah or you were Moses. Because, I mean, just read the stories and the amazing things God did through them. And so it was believed that God, at the end of the age, when he was making all things right again, that these two were going to appear. And now here they are standing with Jesus. And so the disciples are asking, when, especially uh, when Je after Jesus is crucified and risen and, they, and he appeared to them again, he's like, is, are you going to end everything? Is this when it's going to happen? Because this is what they believe. All this is going back to Old Testament stuff. But Jesus is showing that fulfillment, that fulfillment the things that they were being told 
is not how God was doing it. I mean, the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law were confusing the Jews. They believed one thing about the Messiah, the Messiah came as somebody else. And Jesus spent time proving that he was who he says he was. And here we have this image, this picture, this story of with beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is who Jesus says he is. And he's trying to prove that to the disciples. And I want to ask the question, why? Why is this story in here? Why is Jesus doing this for Peter, James, and John? Jesus is showing in this one scene that he is greater than the prophets, than all the prophets, that he is truly God's spokesperson. You know that when, when Peter says, we're going to make tents for you, we're like, what? Why would you make a tent for this? What, what, what does that mean? Well, that same word that is used there, that Peter uses there, is a Hebrew word. Uh, you can't see it there, but it's really pronounced like shekna, shekna. And it means God's presence. Basically, when they were wandering in the desert and they had the tent of meeting, when you, hear, when you see that word in the Old Testament, tent of meeting, that's the Hebrew word. That's the same word Peter's using here. It was to signify God's presence with his people. And so every year, the Jews, one of their uh, traditions, one of their ceremonies, one of their, what we would call a holiday, every year they had this holiday, every year they had this festival, and they would build these tents. They would build them to commemorate God's presence with their people in the wilderness. And so Peter is saying the same thing because he doesn't get what's going on here, but God is showing them that Jesus is, is better than, Jesus fulfills all the things Jesus is the one the Old Testament is pointing to. And he's, he's proving that in this, in this episode. And so one of the things that I ask myself when I read something like this, which to me as somebody that, you know, doesn't know any of this Jewish history, who is not a Jew, who would not have just simply reading that, I know some of this stuff because I read commentaries. I don't just know it. If you were a Jew reading this in in Peter's day, you'd open that and you'd get it right away. Well, well, I didn't. So what's the point of it? If, If... God is doing this, and he's writing this grand narrative, and and everything he's been talking about with the Jews is being fulfilled in Jesus. What does that have to do with me, a non-Jew, who has come after Jesus a long ways away? Jesus lived a long time ago. What does this have to do with with me? That's, That's one of the things I always ask when I'm reading the Bible. What does this story mean? What is this story trying to say to me? to the reader. What is the story trying to communicate? And I think here's two things that I I think that this story is communicating. Jesus is irrefutably the Messiah. That is one of the things this story is telling us. This, This picture that we see, there is no mistaking that Jesus is the Messiah, and there is no mistaking that God is in this thing that is happening. God is in this journey that Jesus is making. So why do we see, why does Matthew include it? Why does Mark include it? I think he, they both include this because, and why I think Jesus does, does this, Jesus doesn't have to prove himself anymore. Jesus is who he says he is. He's been doing it for these last three years. Why this episode? Why this scene? I think Jesus is preparing his disciples for this journey that's going to take him to the cross. I mean, the the scene before, the story before we just heard, Peter's like, no, you're not doing that, because he still didn't get it. This journey was going to get more difficult. It wasn't going to get easier. It was going to get tougher. And because God is who he is, because Jesus is who he is, for their benefit, Jesus does this. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, though you don't get this, God is in this thing God is in this journey that Jesus is making. And this is to help solidify that fact that God speaks and says, this is my son. We heard that before at Jesus' baptism. With who I am pleased, listen to him. And Peter, James, and John fall down on the ground, uh, their face on the ground because they're terrified because God just spoke and God who is holy. I mean, that's the response we see over and over again. It, this, this, to me, is for the disciples. It's for 
us. It's for the reader to say, this is who Jesus says he is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, because this journey is not going to get easier. It's going to get more difficult. And Jesus and God was doing this for the disciples. And that, I like this verse. It's, I don't know if it means anything. It, I was reading it, and I couldn't get beyond it. When God speaks and says, this is my son with whom I am pleased, with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. And verse 7 says this, but Jesus came and he touched them and he told them to get up. And when they did, they looked up and there was nothing there. This, this image of Jesus coming down, because this journey is going to get difficult, Jesus comes down and he touches them. He, I don't know what he did. He laid his hand on them and he tells them to get up. To me, that, that shows that this is for them. Jesus didn't have to do this. Jesus wasn't like, am I really the Messiah? I'm, I'm confused. What are you doing here, God? This was for them. And Jesus comes down and he touches them and he says, get up. Let's go. Don't be afraid. And they start walking down the mountain. And Jesus and the disciples are there talking again like before. And Jesus, they're like, we're not sure what's going on. And Jesus is trying to explain to them this journey that he's going to make. But he goes down, and he touches them, and he tells them to get up. And I think that, to me, that communicates a couple of things about this journey that I'm suggesting all of us have to make to this cross. And one of the things is God meets us where we are. You know, God, as I said, I think God does this for them to fulfill all these prophecies and to show them beyond a shadow of a doubt without any question that Jesus is who he says he is. And, and, and just before that, a week earlier, you know, Peter's probably just still running over in his mind. Jesus just basically said, get behind me, Satan. Jesus basically called me Satan. I can just see Peter being the guy that he was, just can't get over. He can't get beyond the fact that he just really messed up in front of Jesus. And here they are. Jesus takes them, Peter, James, and John. He does this amazing thing, and they fall face down to the ground, terrified, reminded of their smallness in light of God's bigness. And Jesus comes, and he touches them. He puts his hand on them. And I just couldn't get beyond that. Why does Matthew include that? Why does he even say that? He could have just said, Jesus said, get up, don't be afraid. But he says, Jesus comes down and he touches them. And he tells them to get up. To me, that is just the image of God. That God meets us where we are. That God, on this journey that we're making, God comes and he touches us and he says, get up. You can still make this journey. And, we, and we, we get back up and we start making that journey to that cross that God says we have to come to. And not only that, but God will help you make this journey. He doesn't just say, get up and now get back at it again. Jesus comes down, he touches them, and he says, get up, and he walks with them. And then Jesus walks with them and helps them the entire way, all the way to the cross at the very last moments Jesus is there for them. Jesus' heart is for them. He knows this journey he has to make. He knows it's going to be difficult. He shows the disciples that beyond any kind of doubt, it is irrefutable that Jesus is who he says he is, that God is in this thing. Even though I don't get it, I know God is in it. And God says he's going to be with me all the way through it. And the reason why I'm suggesting to you that we have to make this journey along with Jesus, that Jesus calls all of us to journey to the cross, that Jesus, when he claims that he is the Son of God, when he claims that I am the bread of life, when he claims that you will have eternal life in me, when he claims that we will no longer be slaves to our sin, when he makes all these claims... You know, he's making those same claims to us today. I am making those claims to people out there that Jesus is this guy. I still believe Jesus does things in people's lives to show them who he is, that he meets us where we are, and that he will walk with us through this journey 
even if we're trying to figure it out, even if we don't all have it all together, Jesus is walking with us in this journey, this journey that all of us have to make. He says that to us. He says that to the disciples. He says, if you want to follow me, in Matthew chapter 16, the disciples said, whoever wants to, or Jesus said to the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus basically just said, you've got to make this journey too. If you want to be my follower, then you've got to pick up that cross too. You've got to make that journey to the cross and die to yourself. And I think that's the crux of the issue, is, is that little piece of it. You know, Jesus was showing everybody who he was. And the Pharisees said, well, give us a sign. And Jesus says, well, haven't you been watching me this whole time? And you can, you can tell what the weather is going to be, but you can't see that the Messiah is standing right in front of you. There's people, there was a, a famous atheist, Bertrand Russell, who said, if only God would have given us more evidence, then maybe I would have believed in him. I don't think it's the evidence that's the issue when it comes to making this journey to the cross. I think it's this piece, denying yourself, dying to yourself, knowing that you are a beggar before God, where Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's the issue. That's what happens when we walk to the cross. And you know, that's a daily thing. I hope you've made that walk already. I hope you've made that journey to the cross and died to self and asked God to help you make this journey. But that's something that all of us have to do every day. And maybe this journey that we're taking in Lent is a reminder to us that maybe I have to be willing to make this journey again. Maybe I haven't been doing such a great job of dying to self. You know, if you're struggling in your walk, if you're having a difficult time, the image that I see is this is Jesus coming down and, and touching you and saying, hey, Ted, get up. Let's start making this journey again. And Jesus wants us to make this journey because he says it to us here in, in Matthew 16. He says to deny yourself and pick up your cross if you're going to follow me. And he says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me We'll find it. That's why Jesus wants us to make that journey. Because it's in this journey to the cross that we actually find life. It seems weird. This image, this symbol of death is actually a symbol of life to the Christian. Jesus just has a way of turning things upside down, these paradoxes uh, that are part of Christianity. That the symbol of death, which was the cross, is actually a symbol of of life. Jesus makes all sorts of claims about those who want to follow him. And he proves those claims to be true by going to the cross and dying for us and rising again. He proves those claims to be true, I believe, because Jesus comes to us and says, I know you're down. I know this journey is hard, but get back up again. You can make it, and I'm going to walk with you to it. And we're going to walk to that cross. And we're going to die to ourself. And in doing that, you actually find life. That's why this journey is so important. That Jesus says to all of us, this journey to the cross that he's making, all of you have to make that same journey. And that is a daily thing. Dying to self is a daily thing. Making that journey is a daily thing. So this time of Lent, this, this time leading up to Easter, I want you to ask yourself, have I done that? Am I willing to make that journey? Am I willing to die to self? Am I willing to find life? And actually losing it, I find it. Jesus has shown to us, and I believe if you haven't asked, then I, I would ask. I don't think it's wrong to pray that way, that God would show up in your life and say, God, I'm really struggling here. Can you show up and help me? Can you touch me and say, get up and make this journey? Because I'm having a real hard time doing that. I believe God will. I believe Jesus showed that. And I believe 
that when we make this journey, as Jesus is telling all of us, as he's making that journey to the cross, he's saying to all of us, you need to make that journey too. And the question is, are you willing to make that journey with him? Let's pray. God, thank you for your truth and your word. Thank you for meeting us where we are, Lord God, in our struggles. Thank you for walking with us, for being the kind of God that will come down and touch us and say, let's get up, let's make this journey uh, together. I believe that's what Jesus was doing as the disciples were heading on this journey that was going to be very hard for them. Lord, you have called us if that if we want to be followers of yours, that we need to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow you. Because in so doing, Lord, when we, when we lose our life, we actually find life. Lord, help us this time of Lent, this time leading to Easter. Challenge us that maybe if we haven't done that, that you would help us to do that. Maybe if we've been struggling on this journey you've called us to, Lord, I pray that you would meet us where we are. I pray that you would show up in some people's lives. Maybe some people out there questioning. Maybe friends or family that don't know you that are struggling. Lord, I don't think it's the evidence issue. I think it's the dying to self issue. Help us to do that. Lord, as we get ready and as we prepare in these 40 days of Lent for uh, Easter morning, may we do so and be challenged to make this journey with you, to die to ourselves and find life. In Jesus' name, amen.